So don't drink, don't smoke, do meditation and, and drink plenty of water. And probably you do those four things and or don't do those two things and do those two things. <laughs> probably will stay looking younger a lot longer than most people. So my name's Sean Enright. I'm 46. I was born in the U.S. Um, in Alaska. After my freshman year in university, I was back at my parents' home uh, for the summer. And um, I had woken up in the middle of the night to go to the toilet. And uh, on my way back to bed, you know, I turned off the light and I'm crossing the room in darkness. And um, I, I got to the bed, but I got to the very end and I, I couldn't see. So I put my knee down and I went to put my hands on the mattress and there was no bed there um, because I was at the very end of the bed. And when I'd come up to my bedroom earlier in the evening, uh, I had left a glass of water on the floor. <laughs> it was really stupid. Uh, and then just climbed into bed and uh, my leg hit the glass of water. I, did, I didn't feel any pain, um, but there was kind of an acute awareness that my leg hit something, my, my shin, my lower leg. And my mind very quickly went to Oh, it hit that glass. And so I didn't, I didn't think I was injured. I, but I didn't want to step on the glass. So I, I felt around on the floor. I went to feel around on the floor for broken glass so that when I got up, I didn't hurt myself. And I felt, uh, it was like you turn the hose, the water hose on in the garden, uh, in the summer and, I, I knew, oh, you know, I, I've very badly wounded myself. I, my job at that time, I, I had a job every summer that I had to have CPR and first aid training. So I knew the amount of pressure coming out of my leg. I had hit an artery and um, then I, oh my, I locked my bedroom door. You know, I screamed for my parents. Then I recognized, oh, I locked my bedroom door. I've got to get across the room to the door. And um, so I, I got out into the hallway and, and my parents came out of their bedroom and um, I told my dad to call an ambulance and I laid down and my mom came to kind of comfort me. And uh, by the time my dad came back from calling the ambulance, he came with a belt to make a tourniquet on the leg. I was laying on the floor bleeding to death and the only strength I had, I focused on breathing. And when that strength was gone, I stopped breathing and it just skipped from Sean dying on the floor to oneness, to this pure consciousness that, that was unconditioned. And there was no two things, so there's nothing to think about. Mind doesn't exist in that state. Um, because there's no two things, there's no, there's not any of the platform of stress, right? And so it's just pure unending peace. Um, there's no concept of self, but there's a pure awareness. Uh, and then at some point I was back in my body and tubes down my nose and paramedics around me. And, Oh, do you know what your name is? Do you know where you are? And, um, so, uh, from that experience, I was left with, it was, uh, kind of like a new me had been born, but the old me had not died. So there was internal conflict and, uh, I started traveling and doing various uh, spiritual practices, um, looking for a solution. In fact, one of my best friends, he had long-term kidney and heart problems. He had had open heart surgery. I mean, lots of kidney surgeries. Uh, and so he always had high cholesterol. And he 
it took me years to get him to go on meditation retreat with me. But uh, I suggested to him, why don't you take your blood tests before the retreat and then do it after the retreat? And he I think he went on three retreats over the years. And um, there were two things that he saw occur. One is he never got better blood results than after a meditation retreat. The medicine couldn't do as much as the retreat did. Um, he, he changed his, he became vegan. Even that didn't uh, do what the meditation retreats did for him. Um, the other thing he saw, cause he used to always use this excuse. Well, I have to run my business. I have to run my business. <laughs> he, he had a tea company actually <laughs> uh so um but every retreat he went on he would suddenly get all these extra orders that he didn't expect <laughs> and so i you know he he couldn't use that excuse with me anymore especially after the second time it happened he was like i don't understand why this yeah not everything is reasonable right Sometimes there's something going on that isn't so reasonable. Um, so uh, there's that side. I, I had my own, the, one of the things that, it doesn't tend to happen from daily meditation practice. Like if you just are doing 30 minutes or an hour a day, but if you do retreats, one of the things that happens is you're cultivating a lot of energy. And uh, so when the body has a lot more energy, uh, it starts fixing things. Um, so I, from my leg injury, from the near death experience, I had, um, you know, that, that injury required arterial microsurgery and they had to sew all shin muscles. My, my foot was limp because I cut all of the muscles on the front of the leg. And when it healed, my foot was turned inward a bit. Um, and, uh, the first two or three Vipassana retreats I went on, it was painful because you're sitting in half Lotus, but the pain, it worked up from my foot across my knee up into my hip. And over the course of those retreats, it was correcting something. And, um, my foot straightened out and, uh, I don't have issues from that years later following we were flying back from the u.s and my son had fallen asleep on me and i sat in a funny um position for too many hours and i ended up with a bulging disc in my back and the doctor wanted to do surgery i tried i was i didn't want to do surgery i tried physical therapy first and then i went on to vipassana retreats and at that time I could not sit very much because of the pain it caused. And so I did most of those two retreats on my back. And somewhere during the second retreat, my spine healed. Um, so uh, it, it took two retreats and it was like six or eight months because I didn't do those retreats initially. Um, first I hoped the pain would go away. <laughs> then I finally went to the hospital and then I did some physical therapy and then I said, Oh, let me do a couple retreats. Um, I, I've seen some, when it comes to, the, the other thing is it will also cause you to look younger. Um, it's great for the skin around your eyes. Like I, I don't have bad skin, but you know, as we get older, we tend to get little bagginess around your eyes and maybe a, these little bumps almost not. It, it's fairly normal. Um, the skin starts to get wrinkles. And if you go, uh, my experience is going on these retreats, that stuff all goes away. So don't drink, don't smoke, do meditation and, and drink plenty of water. And probably you do those four things and or don't do those two things and do those two things. <laughs> Probably will stay looking younger a lot longer than most people. The All of stress is e either coming to us physically or mentally. So if we're not maintaining mind well, mind can become 
our worst enemy. The the mind, basically what the mind does is it creates a more, um, a deeper individualistic experience. Okay, so from when we're born, it's collecting patterns and uh, memories to fabricate a character that we play. Okay, my character is Sean, yours is Vivian, right? And um, we, that happens because we derive identity from mind. Now, trauma is a specific type of memory. Emotional trauma is a specific type of memory where a strong emotion, a lot of energy gets stuck in that memory. So to heal trauma, we have to bring that memory up and we have to release that energy. Western psychology does probably the worst thing you can do, which is they bring that memory up and they analyze it, which causes stronger identification with it. So you actually, the Vipassana meditation, you're becoming a master of acknowledging and letting go. You're not analyzing stuff, right? And there will be key pieces of wisdom that are realized that you, you, you don't realize them through a mental process. They just come forward. Um, this is what like the, the, um, the four noble truths in Buddhism are. You don't have to study Buddhism. In fact, you should not study. You should practice. If you know in your mind, then it may be much harder to realize at a deeper level because you think you already know. But you know what an ice cream is, right? But if you've never tasted an ice cream, you don't really know what an ice cream is. You know, you can know, oh, it's made from milk and ice and raspberries and sugar and but that doesn't give you the experience of what that thing is right and so there are certain fundamental truths about existence that will become very ap apparent uh, when we meditate and uh, this is why buddha said there's three types of knowledge there's knowledge you gain from reading or from other people there's knowledge you gain from experience and then there's knowledge from meditation uh and you the third one cannot be replaced by either of the other two after my near-death experience the first area of other knowledge i got into was manifestation um i had two mentors who were uh students of tony robbins and uh bob proctor who are two of the most well-known coaches in the area of manifestation. Um, I could tell you a story. I, I didn't believe it, what I was being taught, you know. Uh, but one day I went um, skiing with my mentor, Paul, at that time, and we got a late start. I, I met him at his house. We transferred all my ski equipment to his car. By the time we got to the ski area, it was about 11 o'clock and we were driving past all the parking lots and every lot had a sign saying it was full. And he keeps driving towards the base of the mountain where like those lots fill up first. <laughs> right. And so I said, Paul, I think we're going to have to turn around. There's no way if these lots are full that you're going to get a spot near the base of the mountain. And he said, oh, we haven't done everything yet. All right, Brutus, go out and get me a parking spot. And I'm like, yeah, this time I was 20 years old, maybe. And I was uh, 19 or 20, not more. I, I thought, this guy's crazy. Who's this Brutus he's talking about? And we get to the last two lots. There's a lot on the left and the right. And I see an open spot on the right. And I said, over there, Paul. 
and we're pulling in next to a white suburban and i noticed the license plate on that car and i i said paul you're you're not going to believe this and i said look at the license plate on that car and he turns and he turns back to me and he goes no coincidence that license plate was brutus so for me, Brutus was his invisible friend that did things for him. One of those things was get him parking places, right? And, and so for me, that that was that was like the whole I need to go to India. And then this guy goes, I'll take you to India. <laughs> right. So it was one of those universal things where I was like, okay, clearly there's more to this than I believe. Right. Um and so I, I started paying more attention and, you know, I had my first house and a nice red sports car in the driveway in another year or two. So I, the, I did manifestation for a while in those first couple of years. And, but it, a lot of that's around materialism and materialism itself is empty. I don't mean it's not nice to have a comfortable home and that, you know, you need your food to eat. And, uh, but when we place too much value in those things, give them too much importance, um, we lose sight of actually what really is important. Pleasure and happiness. Most, most people experience happiness very little. Uh, most of what the, the, the materialistic culture is, is uh, marketing is pleasure. So pleasure is the result of fulfilling desire. So, okay, I got, I got my new house and, you know, for two or three months, you might feel good when you're getting home, like, Oh, my new house. Uh, but after that period, it becomes normalized, right? So that good feeling doesn't happen anymore. Same with a car or a piece of jewelry or whatever. Right. So, um, when we look at where is happiness comes from, it actually is one of the things that bubbles up from being truly at peace. And to be truly at peace, you, you have to follow your heart, your heart, like mind is to thinking heart is to feeling. And if you're, if you're denying something in your heart, then, uh, happiness is going to be almost impossible. Right. So when we're in peace, happiness bubbles up, joy, sympathetic joy, like, oh, something good happened for a friend of ours. How wonderful. Uh, my son, when he was maybe seven or eight, we were driving home from school one day. And he didn't know this, but since I was that age, I had been looking for how can we change the world to make it a better place? And I'd had ideas over the years, but I can see down the road and where the problems would be with those ideas. And so he, he asked me, hey, dad, if you could change three things to make the world a better place, what would you change? And I didn't think about the first thing out of my mouth. I, I said, well, I think the first thing I would do was teach everybody how to be a healthy member of a family and that we should then behave that way with everybody as though they're all family. And he stopped and he said, Oh, I think if you did that, you don't need two and three. <laughs> so I now try to live that way and I'm not perfect. Um, I have an ex-wife. She makes it really difficult. <laughs> but for the most part, I'm I'm pretty good at doing that. And I, I think if we all worked at first being a healthy member of our own families, um, and then once we figured that out within our own families, uh, carried that into all our relationships, then pretty quickly earth would be a less stressful place to be. All right. Thank you. And goodbye.